I don't give a shit mode. <laughs> hey, man, we're live. What's up? Oh, did you tweet it out? Yep. Look at the old uh, the retweet fingers here. I had to use the tool. You <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> I mean, that was just so incredible. Like, there's one with Schwarber like that, too, but... Where'd it go? Dude, oh, Tom Lissau has nine home runs in 32 games. He had 10 home runs the last five seasons. <laughs> Balls are fucking juiced. Oh, God. Oh, 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 we can talk about that, too, because I've talked to two different pro pitchers that are fucking steaming. They feel like Major League Baseball is doing is changing and altering the baseballs in a manner that it's reducing the spin rate. Everyone's talking like the Lester, Lester talking about and David Price, and Lester's like, we don't care, just like tell us, but like don't like lie. Like yeah. there's nothing we can they're like Lester was like, there's nothing we can do about it. We just have to like keep trying to make pitches. But like don't like fucking sit there and lie and be like, no, the balls are exactly the same. They're definitely not. Like one hundred percent they're not. And I saw that uh that one uh, White Sox fan account, the Dylan, Dylan Covey Burners account, or whatever. Yeah. He posted that screenshot of like nine guys at AAA with an OPS above 900 last Balls year. It was only like Eloy. Balls <laughs> are jumping in sharp. Like, it's to the point now where I'm almost nervous that. The number. The, the thing is, the balls are the same, so the numbers sh should translate. Right. But it just makes me nervous that people are getting. An over sense so, of like right, oh, the okay. problem is that you get the pitchers who maybe just aren't right. that good, and then mm -hmm. the ball mm -hmm. makes it worse. Oh, uh, all right, <clears throat> three, two, one. What's going on, everybody? It is Friday, May 10th, and you have found the Pinwheels and Ivy podcast. I'm your host, Matt Zawaski. They call me Zoe. Bonus for this episode, I might die. Also with me this week uh, is my co-host, Aldo Soto. What's up, buddy? Well, let me tell you, Cubs Twitter nearly killed itself like the past two days. So Yes, it, yeah. it like almost ate itself. Like that <laughs> alien movie where they just start internal cannibalism. Yep. Yes. And in Vegas, enjoying my cannibal comparison, Kevin Fiddler. What's <laughs> up, buddy? What's up, guys? Jill, still sitting here waiting for the Cubs to trade that showboating son of a bitch, Chris Bryant. Yeah, God. <laughs> He took two extra steps with that bat in his hand uh, during yeah. that walk off, and I was, I was, I was mad. Well, I hey, his trade nerve. value, his trade value is at an all time high. So now, I made, high. I made the tightest fist I've made in a while and shook it really hard at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking showboat. Um, so we do have a great show. I mean, we didn't uh, record last week. Scheduling conflicts got in the way and everything, but. Um, there's some stuff going on. We're going to talk about uh, Ricky Renteria trying to give me an aneurysm with his lineups. Hot seat, hot seat. Uh, yeah, oh, God. A lot of things coming to light with Ricky. That's basically <laughs> all we're going to want to talk about with the White Sox. We can touch base on some – we'll do some housekeeping with some news. Uh, and then on the other side of town, uh, Cubs are back. The oh, Brizzo man. bromance is all the way back. We told everyone to calm their tits, and look what happens. Uh, Jay Hay is still just destroying baseballs, and Javi Baez is auditioning for Old Spice commercials. <laughs> so we'll talk about all that, uh, and then as this show usually does, everything I just said we're going to talk about, we probably won't, and it'll all go off the rails. But <laughs> that's more reason to tune in, and again, I might die. So with all that being said, you know, sometimes you just got to man up. Let's tap this keg. This show is brought to you by TickBlitz, TickBlitz.com, T-I-X-B-L-I-T-Z.com, TickBlitz.com. They're doing a fantastic giveaway that you're going to want to go and head over to their Twitter and check out where they are giving away tickets to the Bears season opener versus the Green Bay Packers on Thursday night. So you definitely want to get in on that competition, you salty dogs. So Bears, Packers, Thursday night, 100 years, rivalry, go for free. Why not? TickBlitz. TickBlitz.com, T-I-X-B-L-I-T-Z.com, TickBlitz.com, stat of the week. Don't have the exact number, but apparently James McCann has the longest at-bats in Major League Baseball right now. From time he walks up to the plate to time his at-bats done, seeing a lot of pitches, taking his time, 
I've never really noticed it, but it came out really evident while people were wanting him to speed up during this almost rained out, which eventually did get rained out, Cubs in or Cubs, geez, Sox Indians game. <laughs> so tickblitz.com, T I X B L I T Z dot com. And the show is also brought to you by Sports Mockery, sportsmockery.com. Make sure you're downloading the app, putting on them push notifications, so you will know the latest and greatest news all around Chicago before your friends. Sports Mockery, sportsmockery.com. And finally, follow us on Twitter at Pinwheels Ivy Pod. You'll get all of our personal handles in our bio, Pinwheels Ivy Pod. So to start this off, so when we do this show, I got a couple monitors set up here. And right before I just went and did this introduction, I always go to the Cubs and the White Sox pages on Yahoo Sports because it's easy to maneuver and it doesn't slow my computer down like MLB.com does. The The current thing, and it's this video, and it's playing on loop right now on the Sox page on Yahoo, is just Tilson falling on his oh, own. No. <laughs> so I just kind of did that whole introduction with just reading, till, yeah, Sniper in the House. Tilson getting falling on his head, but the worst part is how he pops up and he, his head fell off, and he just looks around, and you can just tell by his look, he's just like, "Shit, I just became a GIF." Like, God, <laughs> right? Damn it. Wow, that's that's welcome to the new world. Yeah. The one thing you don't, as we learned this week, the one thing you don't ever want to do is ever go viral at a baseball no. game, ever. Oh, God. And, or as Bryce would say, you don't want to be one of those may mays. <laughs> Wait, who said that? Bryce Harper oh, Bryce. doesn't know what a meme is? He called it a may may. Oh, so he's Chris Burhans. But anyways, um, <laughs> shout out, Chris. You know you said that a bunch of times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so let's start there. Let's get this out of the way. So Charlie Tilson, speaking of, you know, Tilson, he got the call up. Um, and I'm not the biggest Charlie Tilson fan. And people started attacking me because of it on Twitter. But, I mean, why Why should I be a Charlie? I don't – I get, like, the whole he's from Illinois. Cool. Like, he, he's had some injuries. Like, I understand that. I actually – when they first got Tilson, I was like, sweet. Then they, they got him from the Cardinals. I was like, oh, this kid's got wheels. And, you know, I was like, this kid's going to be good. And then he started playing. And I was like, oh, um, um – you know how bad the White Sox farm system was? Because I think that trade was in 2016, and it was at the trade deadline, so it was in July, and that's when like they fell out of the race. And at that time, Rick, Rick Hahn was like already hinting that they were going to start the rebuild in the offseason. At the time when they traded Tilson, I think he became the number three prospect for the White Sox system. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't good for a long time. It wasn't good for – the White Sox had the worst farm system in baseball for like a solid decade. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. Like, that was their yeah, right. Was, was baseball rough. America was, like, you just scroll to the bottom of the page, you'd find the White Sox. It's like me finding my name, like, when I was a kid going into class with the Z last name. You just go right <laughs> to the bottom of the list. At the end. That's how it was when you were looking for the White Sox farm system. So it's All like, you have to do is check for the actual contact information for the website and then look a little bit above that. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, the address, actually, mailing address. Yeah. And, I mean, his – Career batting average, his career slash line is 269, 333, 296 with the 630 OPS. It's not terrible. I don't it's know. Better than Angle. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's. So, <laughs> all right. And the three guys that I just don't think are good rankings. Okay. So I like Tilson the best, Nicky's in the middle, and then you Adam Angle. I hate Adam Angle. You hate I hate it. I just. I don't get it. He robbed three home runs, and now everybody wants him to be your starting center fielder. Defense, <laughs> man. Defense. That's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. Just because he robbed three home runs, he got a huge shelf life. And don't get me wrong, I completely understand that my guy, Matty Davidson, who I was a fanboy for, got a huge shelf life, too, because of, you know, a hot April and just destroying the Royals. That and then you're second. And then you're second guy. Yeah. They talked yeah. about it. On uh, shout out to the 108 guys, they had White Sox Dave on their podcast. When you're done listening to this one, unsubs unsubscribe to this one, then resubscribe to this one, then leave a rating, and then go listen to the 108 guys podcast because it's really good. They have White Sox Dave on. It's a fucking marathon show though. They did three hours. Oh, <laughs> and you can if, if if you cracked a beer every time you heard a beer crack during that podcast, you would die. 
<laughs> Did they wear a diaper? That's a long time to. It's a three hour show, man. True. Yeah, they cover everything. But, anyways, and they talked about the shelf life thing. Like, Ingle robbed a couple home runs, the whole Superman thing, and then he got like to the gold glove finals. And I just, please just stop it. The guy can't hit a fucking, he couldn't hit a ball into the ocean. Like, it's just, oh, but everybody loves these guys and they keep rooting for them. You have to understand. Tilson maybe is a bench guy on a good team just because of his wheels. And, like, he does play pretty, you know, solid defense except for when he falls on his ass. But, anyways, but, like, Nikki D had a, a good year two years ago. You got to let that shit go. <laughs> he had a good, like, two months. Is Yeah, year. and then he hit the walk-off, and it's just like, as soon as he hit the walk-off, it was tough. I hate – I was like – he hit the walk-off. I was like, yeah, walk-off. And I was like – Oh, Nikki hit it. This is gonna buy him three more months. <laughs> oh my god! That's it. And the sad thing is, I'm not even exaggerating. That was literally my train of thought. I couldn't even enjoy a walk off home run by my favorite team because I knew that just bought that guy three more months on the White, on the White Sox. And I mean, he seems like again. I say it every time I talk about Nikki Del Monaco. He seems like a great dude. Like his Instagram is fucking fantastic to follow. He seems like a nice guy. It's just I'm trying to watch my team go through this rebuild. And I understand these are the guys you have to go through when you go through rebuilds, but it's just like, come and you just on. like, you just wish that. And it, and it kind of looks like you're getting that one guy or maybe a couple guys with McCann and we'll get to him later, mm-hmm. but you just like want a couple guys that like, obviously you have your young guys like Anderson, Moncada and you and Eloy who you expect to be part of the future. You just want to find like anyone who's just going to stick around and at least be average. Or like at least be something in the future, yep. then you just have guys who just are man. They're lucky they're on a rebuilding team. So exactly, and Nikki D and Engel are those guys. And people will say, "Well, Engel will be a defensive replacement once this team is good." I'd rather have Tilson. <laughs> Engel literally. I mean, I'm dead serious, and I'm sorry, man. He just he cannot hit. The guy is, and he had like a double or some shit in Charlotte, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. The ball is apparently just – they're playing with Super Balls in Charlotte right now. Oh, yeah. That, by the way, that's going to be, like, the worst yeah. thing. All these guys who, like, go back to – like, Daniel Polka is, like, Polka tearing over, off the ball. He the scoreboard yesterday. <laughs> so, you know, he's going to come back at any time, and that's going to take at-bats from someone. But, see, the thing is with Polka, I think that's a good thing. Juice balls are not whatever. I think he's the type of guy He that, just needs his confidence back? Yeah. I think I really think that's just it with him. And he puts a ball over the scoreboard. All of a sudden, his balls are dragging. He's feeling great, and he's going to come back up. And he'll still he could be a, easy to be a thirty home run guy still in the major leagues this year. It makes a really good point, though. By the way, you're talking about the juice balls. It's not just the juice balls, too. It's you know minor league baseball in general that are having an issue with the spin rate, too. And how's that going to affect some of the White Sox prospects and their upward movement? If while they're like, juicing up the baseballs, how is it going to affect them? Like you're talking about pitching prospects? Yeah, pretty because right now like pitching prospects are gonna they're they're kind of in a in a little bit of a not a spiral, but there's definitely been an offensive increase over right. the last what month and a half or whatever month, barely a month, I guess. But then to be honest with you, that just makes me feel better about what Dylan awesome. Cease has been doing. Yeah. Because he had one one outing that I guess I would say like wasn't great. It wasn't bad by any means, it just wasn't like, holy shit, this kid's amazing. But this year in the minors, he's two and one with a three thirty three ERA, twenty four innings pitched, twenty one hits, uh, thirty strikeouts. His WHIP's one point one five. I mean, he's only given up two homers, but he's just he looks very good. And I guess while we're talking about C's, we might as well bring this up. Carlos Rodon's broken. Oh. <laughs> all right. So I'll give you credit. It's gonna be like two or three years ago. Thank you. I've seriously, I didn't want to ask you to do this, but I was so hoping you did this. So please. No, I, remember, I, was, I remember we were like, I like, we like to bust balls and we we're like, what do you like? You were, we're doing that. Uh, uh, what's his name? That gift or like the cut it out gift or like, why are you talking about trading Rodan? But damaged goods. Like he's proving throughout his career. He's been up since 2015. I think you can't say healthy. He's nope. just a walking, a walking like injured list stint there. And he was doing so good, and I was, like, very excited for him. And, like, 
I was like, all right, sweet, this is it. Like, he just needs to get through. I kept saying, I said, that he just needs to get through the season healthy. And it's bad, though. Like, I know they said Tommy John is now coming up, but, like, they're talking about blood in his muscles and his forearm and shit like that. Like, it's And not- I don't I don't know what the handling was because I, I, I think he said that he was, like, having trouble, like, getting loosened up. But, like, he was throwing, like, 110 pitches every start. And there was that whole thing last year with uh, Kopech and when he got – when he needed Tommy John and he said that he felt something in a previous start, but then he just, like, went through it. And obviously he's missing all of 2019. But, God. yeah, I mean, and, like, whatever it is, like, you can't count on Carlos Rodon anymore. Like, you just can't. No, not at all. Not at all. And that's why it's important that guys like Dylan Cease are – I mean, when's the Super 2 thing over? It's like June, right? Like June, July, yeah. yeah it's June something because that's also when uh, Kimbrel and Dallas Keuchel lose the the draft, the draft pick. pick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so right. a lot of shit's gonna go down in June. It's going down in June. I think Cease is gonna come up in June. I don't think they're gonna mess around. Um, I think they'll get him up. He's shown. I liked uh, Zach Collins was on um, what's his face's show? Shit, the Sox Talk Live show. Chuck Garfield. Yeah, Chuck. And uh, he said that uh, he caught the first inning for Dylan Cease. He went three up, three down. They went to the bull or they went to the dugout, and Cease just looked at him. He goes, "They're fucked. They don't. They're they're they're, they're done." And Collins started laughing. He's like, "I looked at him. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's the first inning, man. It was a good inning, but like, we still got a lot of game left.'" He goes, "No, they're done. They're done. Don't worry about it." And then he went on and like threw seven scoreless. And so the kid's feeling good. He knows his stuff. I met the guy at SoxFest. I talked to him for a while, actually. Cease was one of the first guys I talked to. I was a little nervous, so I talked a lot. But couldn't have been nicer. Super nice guy. Answered all my questions. Was just jacked to be, like, part of SoxFest. And he's one of those guys that I will definitely root for. Like, and he's good. And <laughs> please, well, hopefully. Please, hopefully. we need pitching. God, we need pitching. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so the other thing, and it was brought up by Twitter account, uh, Dylan Covey's burner account, <laughs> but the batting numbers in Charlotte this year are <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> they are playing with super balls down there. And one of the prospects that, you know, very much could see this season is catcher Zach Collins with, uh, McCann's McCann's carving out his spot as the starting catcher for the Chicago White Sox. Uh, he's batting well. Pitchers are asking for him. He's calling great games. Um, but then Beef Wellington, who, buddy, someone made the joke, like, those roids must be wearing off, and Ooh. someone replied to <laughs> him. I mean, the guy's hitting under 200. It's just not looking good, especially when you have a solid two-dog race in Charlotte with catchers. Uh, Shelby's going to be back from injury here pretty soon. Um, but so Zach Collins right now is hitting 256, 370 OBP, 581 slugging, 952 OPS. He's got seven home runs. I mean, compared to his numbers last year in Birmingham, that's a 20 point average jump. That's almost a hundred and. 75% slugging jump. Holy <laughs> shit. His, you know, his OPS in Birmingham was 786. His OPS in Charlotte this year is 952. You know, like you hit and you have guys, and it's, it's not just like the Sox, it's ever it's all cross triple A. The Cubs have like that one guy that we're all making fun of because he has like a made up name, Johnny Field. Oh, a yeah. couple days ago, his like his current or his slash sign from like a couple days ago is 286. 343 and his slugging percentage is 592. Like, and uh, there's that, there's that uh, wins run created plus number where like a 100 is the average. And that, what's that OPS? Like near a thousand or like above 900. That's only 18% higher than the league average. You have a guy, his OPS is above 900, but he's like, nah. Another mm-hmm. Vegas boy. Another Vegas boy. In fact, Chris played against him in high school. Ooh. It's Bishop Gorman, second baseman. He was also a great wrestler. <laughs> there you go. The Cubs have another guy, an, uh, another infield prospect, Trent uh, uh, Giambroni, 
I know I said that wrong, but I don't care. He his slugging percent. I mean, he's only hitting two twenty four, but his slugging percentage is five fourteen. <laughs> extra percent, jeez. So I'm just I have Zach Collins' whole minor league career in front of me right now. If you were ever gonna bring Zach Collins up, this is the year to bring Zach Collins up. He's he had a road bump though. He's on the he's on the injured list. I thought he was good. Nope, concussion protocol. Oh, concussion protocol. Okay. I so guess he took a good. foul tip off the mask. Yeah, that it is what it is with that. So that's a week. Yeah. Yeah, but, but no, but you have to bring him up and. Uh, system since 2016. Um, this is easily his best numbers batting average wise. Just to literally name a number, it's his best year for it, and yeah. Uh, like Han just has to eat that money, whatever Wellington's making. I know we bring it up almost every episode. How yeah. bad that deal looks now, because what was the point of signing a like a catcher for eight million dollars a year when you're not going anywhere? But hold on, let me uh, let me tell you his stats. I just got to scroll down for twenty minutes. Uh, yeah, he's batting one seventy two. All right. Uh, an OBP of three hundred three. Oh, I mean, that's a big difference. That's a lot of walks. Yep. That's 21 <laughs> strikeouts to nine walks. And then okay, eight yeah. RBIs. So they need, I wouldn't be mad if Wellington's gone. And then the other guy that they could probably split the Uber and save some money is Yonder Alonso. Done. 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 His hit <laughs> once. You were brought here for one thing. You were brought here to hit, dude. I. Oh, no, he was brought here to get Manny Machado. Yeah, two things. You were brought here to bring in Manny and hit. <laughs> you failed horribly. You're failing. You failed at one completely, and you're failing at the second one. You, he's, batting, he's batting 172 with an OBP of 284. 26 strikeouts to 18 walks, and he started the year with, like, 100 walks. So, yeah. I mean, so, do you, do you just give, like, Collins those at-bats then? When he's not DH and he catches and when he's – Yep. I'd be okay with that. Man, that's that's just like I mean, this you we know how the Sox operate. They're not known for just uh eating uh contracts here, but uh, right. I think realistically we could see them eat Yonders over Wellingtons. That's right, because I think Yonder has a I can take a team option for next year. Yeah. So yep. Cut. Yeah, you can just cut that, but I mean, the rest of the lineup, the other news for the White Sox is Aloy's traveling with the team to Toronto, um, and they're going to decide if he's going to do a rehab center or he's going to be back. But he, there's video on Twitter of him taking live batting cage sessions in Cleveland. Uh, very good sign. So he'll be back. So that will probably send Nikki D packing. Because um, I honestly, I think they'll send Nikki to Monaco down. They'll keep Cordell up. Sure. You can't, how are you going to send Charlie Tilson down right now? Well, he just, had, he just had that play on Thursday. So. Yeah, but that's it. But, I mean, the guy's hitting 455. He had two stolen bases in this series. Like, he, Also, he made a couple of really nice diving catches. Like, I'm coming around on Tilson, I guess. <laughs> I still don't he, he was at the top of your least guy, hated list. Least, so. Yeah, so he's the least hated guy out of the hated list. I mean. It's like not so, ugly. <laughs> Smiles yeah. real nice. Uh, <laughs> Marla. Yeah. yeah. Marla. Nikki D is probably the one that's going to get sent back. And when Aloy comes back, and I'm fine with that. Do you want to talk about Ricky's lineups? Ooh. So this is the thing. <laughs> Zulk. So the lineups got people pissed off on Sox Twitter. And it was kind of weird because, like, I haven't seen – like people get this fired up. I even tweeted out like this is a, a picture of the White Sox tweet, and I was like, "This is a lot of damn activity for a freaking starting lineup tweet." It had like, like this is like the most mad they've been since uh, Machado signed with the Padres. Well, the thing that people, the initial thing that people were getting mad about is Tim Anderson in the seventh slot. You guys literally just came off of being the AL Player of the Month, and they bury him in the lineup. <clears throat> They asked Ricky about it, and he said, listen, Tim started the year at the seventh spot. That's what got him. To, he won AL Player of the Month in the seventh slot. He feels comfortable there. We like him there. Tim is kind of – I wouldn't say he's in a slump, but he's 
plateauing a little bit, which I'm good with. He's still at 328. He's but, so, yeah, he's coming back down to earth. But that's why. So when I heard him say that, I was like, all right, you know what? That's fine. The thing <laughs> that I don't get is two, two, two parts here. Why the hell are you batting Yo-Yo and leadoff when he has obviously does not like batting leadoff? And why is Nicky Delmonico batting second in a major league baseball lineup? Because you got to get your best hitters and those bats. Nicky Delmonico. Yeah. yeah, his 222 batting average and his 300 OBP got him to get that up in second. But Yo is having such a good year. And he's doing everything that we've asked him to do. He's taking pitches, he's being more aggressive, he's driving the ball to the opposite field. He's playing so much better right now. He's batting 289. You know, he's slugging 507. He's got seven home runs. Guy's just – he's doing good, and we're finally seeing the yo we traded for. And he's bat, He's doing all that out of the second spot, and then you throw him up in the – let's mess this up. Let's put him in the leadoff spot. And I know, Kevin, and I know, I know both of you know that being put in the leadoff – Changes your entire mentality. Yeah, um, that, but also, you know, and, and I know you're gonna you're gonna talk about the leadoff man mentality, but actually, that's something that's kind of actually trending out of baseball. Um, a lot of guys, it's it's the idea of you want your best hitter to get as many at bats as possible in a game. It, it really, you only lead off once. You only have to actually lead off once. And so, if you're throwing your best guy in the leadoff spot, if it's your perceived best guy, um, you're gonna let that guy get as many licks as possible and many opportunities. He's gonna lead off once. All right. Trust that he can get on base. Someone can drive him in maybe. At that point, it's it's all over again. But he will maximize his plate appearances, which if he is as good as he's been, it only can benefit you. And, then, you know, with Tim Anderson, I think that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. He doesn't want to move him anywhere because he's he's raking right now in that spot. And until, you know, until maybe, you know, if you could hold off as long as possible and keep a guy in a spot that they, they can excel in, you, you don't really want to mess with it until – you know, then he's going to hit a – once he finally hits a little wall, I think you'll see the lineup start to shuff, shuffle a little, adjust a little bit. Then he might jump to the five or six. Because I know, I mean, it's hard to hit when you got a guy in front of you hitting like 118 or whatever, whoever, whatever it is. That's that's rough because there's no protection. They're going to pitch – they're going to go after the guy in front of you. You're going to lead off a ton yourself because that guy's going to make the last out of an inning. Right. And, you know, it's so I think with, with Anderson, it's lightning in a bottle. It really does load up the speed in the bottom portion of the lineup. And, you know, if you've got – um, you know, you've got a tough guy not or in the one hole. By the time that guy comes up in a situation where he can drive in a run, there's Tim Anderson at second, third, scoring on a two-out knock. So it mm -hmm. could he could be doing that with a, the express purpose of just putting those two guys within three or four bats of each other for plate appearances. All right, I just looked up his splits, mm -hmm. and I was about to go off on Ricky because I think I, we've talked about it only in a previous show how I've said you got to have your your younger when you're in the developing year, and that's what the White Sox are in. Mm -hmm. As much as like Sox want to see him like compete, it's still uh, a de uh, developing year for their their young guys. I was like, you got to get your all your young guys the most at bats. You got to give them the experience. Mm -hmm. But fine, all right. Ricky says he's the Tim Anderson. He got hot in the seventh in the seventh hole. He's right, and out of the sixth hole. So batting sixth and batting seventh, Anderson's nine for twenty three. He has. Let's see, two home runs batting sixth, the home run batting seventh. Um, so, yeah, I guess. I, well, that's the other thing. Talk to Ricky, manager of the year. <laughs> <laughs> that, brings, that brings us to the other thing. So, Ricky was getting bombarded with these questions about his lineups because the Twitter outrage, and that's just the world we live in now. And it came out like – he didn't say that he doesn't make the lineups, but he didn't say that he makes the lineups either. And, what was this? <laughs> and it was like, Ricky, you, you're the manager, dude. Like, just say, like, yeah, these are my lineups. And if you don't like it, fuck yourself. I would have respected that way more. But they, it comes, I guess they got, like, the team. And most baseball teams do now. Like, you know, they do probability and analytics. And, like, this guy, when he's facing lefties and it's blah, blah, blah. And so he makes the line – they give him the lineup off of that. But it was just really weird for me to hear the manager of this team be like, uh, well, you know, this is what they give me. It's like <laughs> – The thing is, that's probably like what almost every MLB team does, but Ricky just stated it in a bizarre way. 
Yeah. And of course, if you're in a system that, that has a bunch of talent developers, you're going to, they're going to try and do their best to develop what they have, but mm -hmm. also keep the pieces of the puzzle strong. And if they project on a more talented team to, to, to find themselves, whatever slot they'll be hitting in, why not have them get comfortable there now? I mean, again, that's a blessing to have like a guy like McCann hit because again, you can, you can kind of, you can kind of avoid saying, you know, um, should we have this guy moved up in the lineup and he's, he's raking and, Again, you get younger players, you want to protect them, but you also want to get them as creatures of habit. And if you project someone, like say like an Eloy, he projects to be like a three guy, like a four guy, right? I mean, so when he's there, he's going to want to hit in those spots because he's going to want to see the pitch selection he's going to get. He's going to want to see what kind of spinners he's going to get and how they approach him. And you get comfortable, whereas you've got someone, again, you wherever you're putting them, those guys, those analytical guys, they again, the nerds, pencil pushers are going to send down saying, hey, look, this is the optimal spot for this person to develop in this role that we project them as here in two years. They're looking at projectables. This right. team is doing well. They're doing all right, but they're not worried about this year. This year is not the year they're expecting to contend. Oh. They're looking at the bigger picture and saying, hey, develop this individual in this spot. Let them get comfortable. And you know what? <laughs> the rest will take care of itself as it unfolds the way that at least our analytics predict they will. Right. And, I mean, they're sitting at 16 and 20. And I guess – again, my big thing was just Nicky Domonico bad in second. And then <laughs> – but with regards to Ricky, like I, I get you and I'm, I like that they use the analytics and I understand that like that's where baseball is now. But the difference between a good manager and a bad manager is in-game decisions. And Ricky's not doing really hot with that. The best decision he's made in like the last two weeks was he had Yomer bunt with guys on first and second and moved the runners over. And then Cordell came in with a clutch base hit Scored, shut up. Scored the two uh, runs. Oh, against the Red Sox? Did you, did you, no, did you just say made a good decision to bunt? Yeah, because it was Jomer, and he's a suck-ass baseball player. <laughs> so you might as well. You hit guys you can't hit. You make a protective ult. Those who can't hit, bunt. Nuke, if you're listening right now, your baby sleeps well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But that, I mean, a lot of this stuff, especially, and I'm, I'm sure some of this goes on Cooper, but the way they've been handling pitching, uh, some of the situational hitting, the substitutions, just the stuff that you look for a manager to be the last word on, it's been pretty brutal, Ricky. And it's been, it's been kind of rough for a, a couple of former managers and coaches from the Cubs. David Martinez is like, about to get fired with the Nationals. Ricky Renteria is just getting grilled left and right. So let's, be honest, let's be honest. It's much easier to manage in the American League. Oh, There's sure. not much. You're, you're handling your pitchers, but you're not worried about double switches and, and not generally. You know, you might make a defensive replacement late, but really that's why, again, that's why some of the purists love the NL anyway. But that's – that's Ricky, Ricky has a it, – it's hard to screw that one up other than if you are – Quick trigger with your pitching staff if you're if you're obviously you're making right. lineups, but if you're also playing poor matchups and, and making gut decisions, but I, NL is just a different beast. So Davy, I mean Davy's kind of screwed for a whole different reason, I think. And as so, we always say, if you have a bad bullpen, you're just going to be a really you're going to look like a really bad manager. So right, you do so, no right. It's interesting though that you bring up the uh, the Nationals. They suck. Some of the national. <laughs> National media have been talking about the Nationals and the possibility of them being big time sellers this year. Like I'm talking like Rendon Scherzer sellers. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I the White Sox, the Max Scherzer does nothing for the White Sox, but there certainly weren't buyers in the off season. But Rendon, mm, I, <laughs> I wouldn't be terribly mad. <laughs> Do sure. it. Remember how the White Sox were in uh, trade rumors last year that they were going to get Manny and be like, hey, we'll have Manny for like three months, show him it's really good, and mm -hmm. do it with Rendon? Why not? <laughs> Luis Robert for three months of Rendon? No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, just that's something just to keep an eye on, I guess. There's nothing, I mean, Scherzer will get traded to a contender for a boatload of prospects. Man. No, that contract. He still has a lot of money. Yeah. The Nationals are screwed. They're they're a team that they invested like a billion dollars in the rotation, and 
And they've like, had a whole bunch of injuries, and now they're just bad. What's crazy is that they're shocked that they got injuries when those guys were already injury prone to begin with. I mean, right? I'm not. I'm not sure a single one of their studs hasn't had at least some sort of arm surgery over the past. I mean, you know, obviously, what's his name? Um, Strasburg. Strasburg. Yeah, from I mean, San Diego State. Before he went to San Diego State, he was still he was already having arm issues. I mean, he was one of those freaks that came out of nowhere. Um, you know, but they do have a couple good guys. They have a couple good younger arms. I mean, I don't know if you know who Eric Fetty is, but Eric Fetty's a Vegas boy, and he's he was just part of a no hitter. I mean, but they've got younger, cheaper arms, so it might not be a bad time for them to start selling if it's not working out. But you know, it, that's a chasm left behind because they left a creator called Bryce Harper. They thought addition by subtraction would help, and it turns out, right? Nick, yeah, they came out of the gates a little hot, and everyone was like, "Oh, didn't need Bryce." Mm. It, speaking of trades, and we can transition to the Cubs here. Yep. Cubs, they just put Pedro Strope on the DL or the IL, whatever it is now. He's going to be out for like at least two weeks, maybe three. He said it's not going to be longer than a month. It's the same hamstring injury he had uh, it was in spring training, and he had a similar one last September against the Nationals. Um, so the Cubs like need like a top-end reliever. Yes. Bruce Levine's reporting from the score that the Tigers and the – who was it? The Tigers and the San Francisco Giants are like scouting the Cubs really closely. Uh, so who's, got, who's Detroit got that you'd want? Uh, uh, I think the one guy that I've seen like the fans have been looking at is uh, what's his name? Shane Green. He's a righty. He's like 30 years old. He has one more year after this year. Doesn't make a lot. Yeah, he's he's had season. He was bad last year. Had a great season a couple years ago. Six inning pitch, one point six nine ERA with a point seven five whip. Whip. Thirteen saves and sixteen opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's the Tigers. Team? Remember how we like one of the first shows? The Tigers were in first place. He had like more saves than the Cubs and like yep. the Nationals combined or something. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that could be a guy, Will Smith for the Giants. But the White Sox, we're talking about teams that maybe aren't going anywhere. That could be sellers. The White Sox, they have a couple guys. They, they traded for Alex Colme. They that was like a steal. They traded uh, their backup catcher Omar Narvaez for him to Seattle. He has one more year left on his deal. I think it's like a team option or arbitration. I don't remember. What are you giving me for him? Well, I suggested. Albert Elmore Jr., center fielder. You get you need a center fielder. So, so are you trying to tell me like Charlie Tilson plus? Is that what you're uh, doing? No, you got like like Charlie Tilson and Adam Angle plus. Oh. You get two in one. <laughs> tell you what. Plus better hair. Better hair than both of those Fair guys. Fair enough. San Francisco's got a little bit of good stuff for uh if you're looking for some bullpen help. I mean, Trevor got He's what, 15 appearances, 196 ERA, 18 sitting innings pitched, 18 Ks, 0.71 whip. He's getting it done on the bump in relief. That's not Just Pedro like, Stroke. Like the Cubs need <laughs> – because Pedro Stroke's not coming back for a while. Brandon Morrow, he was shut down. They don't know when he's coming back. Carl uh, back. Monty's back. He rolled in a new pitcher today. He was, with the saved, the, saved the game on uh, Thursday after you Darvish was terrible again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, so the Cubs just don't have, like, a shutdown closer. They had Steve Ciszek, who, like, I mean, you can rely on him, but then do you really trust him as your closer? They have Brandon Kinster, who's been great, who, like, <laughs> all the Cubs wanted DFA'd, or, Cub, like, most Cub fans wanted him DFA'd, but he's been great. Maybe he can slide in. But the Cubs just don't have that guy. They need they need some help. No matter, no, even if Strope comes back, like, the Cubs still have to make a move. And they've had a couple of their prospects up. They've had... um Maple. Well, it's made Maples. He was up. Carl Edwards Jr. is back up from AAA. He's, I mean, it was against the Marlins, but he looks well. better at least. He's not walking, guys. So that's a, an improvement. Sorry. I was just, I'm searching for pitchers. And God, Chris Paddock is good. Oh, well, that's why. Give me Alex Colomay for Albert Elmore Jr. <laughs> there's Trevor Gott. There's, I mean, I mean, we're talking about the Giants too here. I mean, they've got some, what is Reyes Moranta? Is that how you say his name? Yeah. And then the Giants are weird because, like, they they did that whole thing. They did that whole thing where, like, they got um, Longoria from the Rays, and then last year they got uh, McCutcheon. And, like, they're just like building an old team to contend. 
but it's like everyone saw that that wasn't going to work out. And now they have like no outfielders, but they're still trying to compete. Who knows what the hell they're trying to do? Well, that makes so, a good sense for the Cubs to make a move. I mean, you've got a couple outfield guys. You got either Almora. I I'd prefer. I don't know how you feel, but I I prefer to keep Almora than than Hap. I know Hap's a little versatile too, but I just think Almora. I know he's not maybe a. I just I believe his defense is going to only get better, and I believe that when he plays next to Jason Hayward, I think that he's going to learn from a guy where I don't think Hap is going to be ever going to be yeah. really that plus defender. And Almora, he has a little bit of that it factor, and you know sooner or later they're going to fill. You know they're going to fill you know, the corner spots with, I mean, they do have offensive guys, but you do need that guy that can kind of troll the gaps. I and mean, he trolls like, the gaps well. Like, used correctly, Albert Elmore is great with the Cubs. Like, he's he's your stud center fielder, defender. He can, he's supposed to hit lefties. He's not doing that great this year, but he's getting on a hot streak. Um, But when he starts to play, like, every day, or when he leads off, he can't, he's just not a leadoff hitter. Used correctly, he's great. He fits. Uh, he has a nice role with the team. But when he starts to like play more often, that's where like you see that he's he has a lot of down moments where it's like, man, I wish there was someone else starting. It's crazy to think he's only twenty five. I feel like he's been around forever, but he's only twenty. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is a young twenty five if I'm reading the date right. But he, and he is- came up like uh, was it twenty sixteen? I know him and Chris roomed together a little bit where, I don't know if it was single A, double A, or maybe Tennessee. I think they might have been roomies for a little bit. Those two guys are, those are, that's their kind of group. You know, Mm -hmm. they've all been together. They've all come through, I guess, together. Whereas I think Hap was a little bit younger, so he wasn't really a part of their crew. And I feel like there is a little bit of a click that might be there. That group of guys that all came together. I mean, Baez was like the old man with Jim Hendry, and then Rizzo came in, and then Rizzo really wasn't a part of that crew. That's the weird part of like that whole relationship is that Rizzo just came over as the guy. Yeah, you yeah. the four guys with Rizzo and Del Moro. Mm-hmm. You know who's yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, heads too, which is great. Trade cool made for Del Moro. Wade Davis. Oof. The Rockies? <laughs> yeah, he's probably not. And well. his like $40 million left on his contract? I know, I'm just messing around. He, can stay. he has actually got a disgusting sad line right now, but yeah. It was I'm pretty funny saying. last year. He was terrible. Like for most of the year with the Rockies. Uh, this guy looks pretty. No, that's. I mean, there are guys like we saw it last year when like the Cubs, the Cubs, blast them all you want for the the off season for some of their previous free agent signings. But when it comes to finding relievers in the middle of the year, they'll just pop up with Jesse Chavez out of nowhere, who like becomes the best reliever. But that's problematic, team. though. You can't. I mean, because again, like we talked about it in the, they went. You can't. The two and seven start was almost a direct yeah. bullpen issue. And if you're, you know, again, last year sucked because they, again, the stupid playing game and everything got just jacked up. And Milwaukee started believing, and they were just close enough to get back in it. And then, obviously, went one of those games, one of those. You know, how do you? How can you be so ill prepared? You know, that's true. The Cubs don't deserve a pass for how the season started because everyone knew it was a problem and they are just like, oh, hopefully they get better. Well, it's like a pitcher that can't get can't figure it out to the second inning. Well, then you throw your first inning in the bullpen. How about a management maybe throw their first inning, you know, in, in January or something? I don't know. They, they just, they, they seem to like underplan. They underplan, you know, and I hope it doesn't bite them in the ass. I mean, it could, it might not. I mean, the way they're playing right now, it won't matter. And hey, there's still, really there's still Craig Kimbrell out there. Mm. Yeah. Every time the bullpen blows a save, yep, Kimbrough gets uh, more gets more wings. Yep. <sighs> well, the other thing, and I don't want him to talk about this too long, but literally, as I click on the MLB homepage, the first story is Cubs are taking plenty of L's off the field. Yeah, they a, are with a huge yeah. picture of Addison Russell. And, Which- which is ironic because they've won ten of eleven. They're not taking many L's at all. Right. That's the thing. Like the on the field product is, hasn't been better this year, and that's how, I mean that's where we focus more on the show, and that's how I'd like to keep it. But like, I mean, speaking, bringing in the the report about the Tigers and um, and the Giants scouting the Cubs. What if they're like seeing what how Russell looks? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, that's the funny part is this has become it is you now it's it's good, completely Jekyll and Hyde. You've got the on field product being great, but the Cubs are taking guff, but they're not taking guff from like really baseball people. They're taking guff from TMZ. 
they're taking guff from you know some of the some of the more more news oriented but not sports oriented like sites because of obviously what Addison has done and now you got the, obviously the the idiot with the uh, the the biggest fail ever behind a camera the, the worst camera like mugging ever and right. because they're taking it but they're not taking it on the field as a product which is it's almost it's a welcome distraction because it doesn't have any effect on the guys on the field other than the guy that obviously Addison in the, in the clubhouse but I feel like that clubhouse is weird enough and goofy enough and and professional enough that if Addison steps out of line, he'll be pretty quick out of there. And I'm not entirely sure that Epstein's not waiting for the opportunity to pull the trigger. And that Addison is on such thin ice that it's like, if you fart in the wrong direction, Addison. But if you're Theo right now, you just have to, you're, you're taking every bomb thrown at you. Every press conference, he's there. He's answering every question. He's not shying away. And he has to be just like pulling his hair out every time he reads an Addison Russell quote. And it's not even like the some of them that are taken out of context, and it's like you find out later, all right, maybe it wasn't that bad, like the Terry Crews comparison. Ugh. Or, but then you have like his quote from I don't know if it was from last night or from today. That Zoe, you're reading it before we started to record, where he's like, "Well, if fans want to boo someone who's trying to help the team win a World Series, like they can do it or something." Like it's not about that, Addison. That's not why they're. It's adding that little part in there. It's adding the a guy that's helping them to win the world. If they say, "Hey, they want to boo me," it's okay. I deserve this. Yeah, to earn their respect back. Hey, there's been zero, oh. and like I think the full quote was like even worse. Like that was just like the main yeah. part that was like, full, but like it's very so aloof. He goes, "Oh, the article says, oh, he heard the boos, all right. He just doesn't seem to be particularly affected by them." Now the quote starts. I'm a baseball player for the Chicago Cubs. Addison Russell said. I'm one of the dudes in this clubhouse. I'm one of the guys who go out there and put their bodies on the line. We do it because we love it. We want to win, and we want to bring another championship to Chicago. And then here's the kicker. He goes on to say, and if hometown fans want to boo someone that's trying to help bring the team a World Series again, then that's on them. I mean, See, tone that's, deaf that's quote correct. after tone deaf quote. Yeah, that's tone deaf. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, that's, like gotta be like, are you fucking kidding me right now? Like, I, I basically put my neck on the line, taking every shot from like every fan, every like news outlet that's criticizing us, and you're like, no remorse. Like, no one's. We talked about it a little bit how like, I don't think he's ever admitted to like do anything wrong. All he's ever said about the accusations and the suspension was, I accept the suspension. But it's. It, tone deaf is, is probably the best word to describe it because again, everything that you read up to that point, though, was on point. It's it's he's like him or not, douchebag or not, anybody that's going out there and playing the game is throwing their body around and beating their up, and that's that is true. But then when you, if he'd have just said, it just stop there, maybe like if they want to boo, yep, boo. Like, but other than that, God, like maybe it's because I like. I don't think none of us has been in that situation or like in that bad of a situation. But like, how hard is it just to be like, I've like done terrible things. I've expected, I expected that reaction. All I can do is just like show that I'm becoming a better person. How hard yeah. is that? that and, I'm, and I know he's, and I know he said like, oh, my goal is to become a better person. But hey, just how you had like your robotic answers during spring training, just, just keep feeding that same answer. <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to help the team win. If they can, they want to boo me, they can boo me. Like that's not the point. They're not just booing you for any random reason. But also, in, in, in um, the, uh, by no means defending the kid, but the fact is, I'm sure that the line of questioning has become uber aggressive. Everyone's looking for the sound bite that's going to get the clicks. He, he's probably, I mean, the, the questions that I'm, I'm sure that's one of the reasons why the Cubs are kind of trying to at least somewhat insulate him in a lot of this. Um, Epstein can handle this shit because Epstein, he's a, I, honestly, I don't think there's ever been a guy uh, in baseball. He's got to be one of the greatest forces in baseball and modern baseball, I believe, in our generation. I mean, the dude is out there. He's wearing it. He And, and so he's insulating his guy. But at the same time. Addison's probably getting a line of questioning. I, I, I mean, eventually someone's going to ask him about the actual game of baseball. They're not going to ask him about the booze. They're, you know, but but right now, do something else, man. I mean, on his case, you know, Tim Anderson's going out there saying, "Hey, every time I steal a base, you know, I'm going to donate this to that." God, 
go outwardly looking to like to, to reach out to the domestic violence community and say, hey guys, look, I'm an idiot. I messed up. Only thing I can do is move forward and be my best self. Let me do something to help you. Let me reach out to you. Let me, here's, here's a hand. What can I do to help? And if they say, go screw yourself, then fine. Go screw yourself. But at least reach out. At least make, even be, dis be disingenuous. I don't care. Just say it at least. Like, I'm that's the person, if someone says something. And that's the thing. It's, and that's the thing. Like, maybe, hey, maybe he does, like, do the whole cliche soundbite where he says, oh, I am, I am doing this and this. And, like, of course, you're still going to have people who just, at this point, don't care. Mm -hmm. And but you still have people who are like, all right, let me see anything, something, yep. and you're just getting these. I mean, as been, they're just tone deaf answers. We're like, do you get why? Do you get the situation that you were in that you put yourself in? Like, why this is happening? And it doesn't seem like he gets it at all. No, and that's 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 where he's losing. That's where I mean, Theo has to be like calling Scott Boris because Boris is age. He's gonna be like, are you fucking kidding me? What is this? Yeah, I don't know who their talking. PR like team is or. What? But oh, they got to be miserable. Fire yeah. them, cause... Well, no, they, they're trying to pick up the pieces after he goes out and says something stupid. Nobody's coach. I guess nobody's coaching him right. Yeah. He's yeah. got to be coached on what to say. He he almost has to tell have a teleprompter at this point. But when you're when you're sitting at your locker and you got eight thousand people holding their cell phones in your face and whatever whatever else I've heard, you, you know, maybe they got that creepy dude that looks like you know Thomas Jefferson trying to interview people in the back of the locker room. But you're trying to trying to handle these questions and you do you. I can't imagine. I mean. He deserves every second of it, but I can't imagine what it feels like to have an aggressive set of reporters hovering over you, shoving those in your face. You can almost feel the intensity probably off of their bodies, like the heat and whatever, and asking these aggressive questions and trying to like actually give an answer that I, honestly, a lot of people might even crap their pants. Like you might, he's, he's not handling it great. I, I'm not sure how many people would handle it well, but there's a reason why he also struggles with self-control and, and some of the other issues that got him into this in the first place. So this is his rite of passage. This is his, what are you, what a cathartic crucifixion, or what do you want to call it? He's, he's, he's wearing it. And you know what, if he makes it through on the other side, all of this, and he does change, he's earned it. But if he doesn't, he's going to crack under the pressure and eventually he's going to fall apart because you know what? You can't shine shit. You know how you avoid having a bunch of reporters with an aggressive line of questioning, shoving things in your life. face? Don't hit your wife. That is true. And pay her in pennies for child support. Yeah. Basically, be a decent human being, and you don't have to deal with any of this. Not vacation Bible school. You're not trying to raise pennies to see which group. You know, no. Right. It's just if, if Addison Russell just had one quote, because every time he always prefaces, like he, he doesn't ever like directly um, confront like the the allegations and what he was suspended for. Because he always says like, oh, like you don't get it right the first time. Or like we make mistakes or something. Mm -hmm. Just like say, I did terrible things. I'm going through this process. I'm trying to become a better person. How much is that is him following what his lawyer tells him to say though too? There could be some legal stuff pending that he can't say something in public where he, you know, I, how much is it worth to you though? It, should it be an effort? I, she should get three quarters of what I own anyway and move on. Because I, it sounds like he's, he's on script for some of the stuff, but when he finally runs out of the script, he's left and the devices of his own are matter. very good. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there is anything left or, I mean, it's just, I mean, as expected, as we said, since like the suspension came out or the allegations came out and then this was to the suspension last October, it was just going to be a PR nightmare and it's not getting any better. No. And then you got someone throwing the okay sign up. And again, so yeah, I'm not even getting into that. No. So, uh, <laughs> East, nope. I mean, just look at this this show. This is a Chicago baseball show. The Cubs have won 10 out of the last 11. And we've talked about this Edison Russell shit about the same amount of time. Let's, let's get to something positive. Let's talk about Chris using an axe bat all of a sudden. And That's right. Woof. Whose bat? He's using Chris. an axe bat, which is that, like an axe handle. It was like one of his spare it's bats. Paul Bunyan now. Yep. He's just lumberjacking the hell out of it. It just like it's supposed to. I don't know, it's like some technical thing where like it gets your hands faster yeah, get, through the zone or something. Like that. Which is good because hey, he's hitting ninety nine mile an hour fastballs in her half, four hundred twelve feet. God, he, I mean, he was hitting well before that, and and you can see it with Rizzo too. They were they were there were a couple loud outs prior, but what they've done over the last what how was was it ten days maybe has been. No, I think it's long. I think it's since like April nineteenth. Let me find it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, Chris, when I mean, you're looking at what they're doing at the plate, I mean, even in the game that he hit the three run jack, you, he hit a couple, he, he strafed a couple hard hit baseballs the right side, caught, you know, deeper down, especially in the right field corner. And those are good. They're just well hit. And I think, I, I want to say A Rod, it was the game A Rod was broadcast. He's like, that ball, that, he didn't, he just missed that one. That was actually well struck. And you could almost see it developing a little slow. You know, he's someone, you know, Chris Rizzo's a different guy, but Chris is a guy that takes three steps forward one step back and that's his pattern he goes and he does well league adjusts adapts they find a new flaw he struggles but he fails to learn how to succeed and that's what i he's never not been that way he's always been a guy that he'll go oh for six oh for seven and he'll figure out what the hell's the wrong and then he's gonna boom and triple that and then he'll struggle a little bit back and then triple that and that's what he usually does that's why he's sitting 240 right now but by, I'm, I'm, i can almost guarantee by the time we hit Late July, he's going to be somewhere around 270, 275. It's just, it's, it's three good for every one bad. And that's really how he focuses. Whereas Rizzo, he's just, Rizzo's just going to, he's, he is the vet. And he's just, I mean, he's not, he's just old. the constant guy. Like, no matter what, at the end of the year, he's going to hit like 280, yeah. 30 home runs, 100. It evens out. Yeah. Right? And it's great to even out because if it even out from, evens out from where he's at right now, he's going to have a monster summer. All right. So the last, let's see, since April. All right, here we go. Updated oh. combined numbers for Bryant. This is this was during the middle of Thursday's game. So Bryant was one for two with a home run, two walks. Rizzo was two for four with a home run. In their last 18 games combined, so since April 19th, their combined slash line is 320, 451, with a slugging percentage of 750. 13 home runs, 12 doubles, 37 RBIs. And 25 walks compared to 19 strikeouts. That's phenomenal. That's I mean, trade them. Trade them. Right? No, that was like that was the stupidest thing because Chris Bryant, all he did in his like, let's see, did he win? Was it like high school player of the year? Then yeah. college player of the year. Andre player. Then of the year. rookie of the year. Then MVP. And then he put up better, like all around numbers after his MVP year. And then he was on pace to like have better numbers again in 2018 and then he fucked up his shoulder right and then he fucked up his shoulder and his he was on the dl twice he missed a whole bunch of time and he was never the same he was never healthy for the rest like after the middle of may in 2018 and then he had like two slow weeks and fans were like he's broken he's done trade him they should trade him the offseason what are the cubs doing and guess what chris ryan's actually good that panic was <laughs> the stupid oh. thing we're not talking about we're not talking about a guy. It's like let's say like uh I don't know, because even Baez was like like pretty a good hitter in twenty seventeen and then he had his breakout year in twenty eighteen. But let's take him for example. Because he had his breakout year and he finished second in the MVP race. So let's say like through hypothetically speaking, like through like this year in July, Baez was like hitting like two thirty, had like on base of two fifty, like something stupid, and like he was just bad. Like, all right, fine. You want to be like, oh, maybe that year was a fluke. Like, all right, hopefully he just gets back to, like, hitting, like, 270. And, you know, he hits, like, 20 home runs. And he still plays his great defense. But we're not talking. By the way, Baez also getting just better and better. Oh. We're talking about Chris Bryant, who not only has he just been great for the Cubs, he's been, like, he's off to one of the best starts in, like, Cubs history. Yeah, he's reached base, what, 19 straight games now? 19, 19 straight games. But just, like. Just his career, like his first four years, even with his crappy year mm. last year, which was because of injury. <laughs> yeah, because of injury, which he still had like an OPS of like close to 800 with like one good shoulder. It's like, I don't, I have no clue why fans for a second doubted you that want, Chris Bryant was going to be good again. Do you want to hear how crazy like panicked fans were? I had friends from high school, cold, high school teammates. Hey, hey, can you reach out to Chris? Can you reach out? Hey, I think you should open his stance up. You know, he's. I'm like, dear God, it's two weeks. Okay, he struck out like 11 times the beginning of his senior year of high school because there were 35 radar guns in the bleachers every time he even set foot in the diamond. There's a lot of stuff coming in this season because they're wondering, is he going to succeed? He's he's a, he's a fail to succeed guy. He he doesn't fail to succeed. He fails in order to succeed, and that's the thing that people don't realize that. He is an adjuster. He will go out there and fix what's broken. And the fact that people are like, you know, oh, God, he knows his swing better than anybody. Mike knows that swing pretty darn well. But in the end, Chris knows himself. 
And when he goes out there and he swings the bat, you know, the biggest knock on him coming up as a high schooler. Oh, he can't hit the inside fastball. Won't be able to hit an inside pitch, you know, that's a high velocity. You know, he's not going to, you know, Ty Law or whatever his name, Keith Law, always, blah, 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 blah. Not going to be able to hit a fastball at the major league level. Well, how's that working out? Now the fact, you know, now he can't hit the other way. Well, look what he's doing. Look where he's hitting the baseball this year. He's going the other way. And now what has he done? He's forced him to come under the hands, and now he's dropping the hammer or the ax, if you want to call it that. Hey, But he's all of a sudden he's forced pitchers to come in, and now the consistency of taking walks, and early on he was letting a couple of the mistake pitches go. He's not letting those go now, and it's forcing people to pitch to his strength. It's only a matter of time when a guy adjusts. When a guy's taking a walk or two every ball game. And in front of a couple guys like Javi and, and, and Rizzo that are hitting the ball well, and, and Jay Hay, for God's sake, God, you're not going to want to put that guy on. So you're like, hey, well, let this guy beat us. Well, now he's beating you. And now what are you going to do? Because now that two, three, four spot is dirty. And, and well, even five. And Contre- I mean, Contreras Contre- is like maybe the best hitter on the team right now. I know. And so it's, it's, a, it's a pick your poison. It's a murder. It is becoming a virtual modern murderer's row, or at least modern, you know, murderer's. You know OPS because I mean it's a lot, a lot of extra base hits with that. You know those four. And five just guys. and just one last point on Brian and his struggles. Like the one thing for me that year that I've always noticed with him, when he's on, obviously you can like obviously tell right away when he's like hitting for power and he has those long majestic, you know, four hundred and fifty feet home runs. But you could tell that he was just he was pressing because he was just chasing a lot of strikes. And you can say whatever about like the high strikeout total that he had his rookie year. But like he always took his walks, and he like he knows the strike zone, and that low pitch. Now that he's back on, like now that he's in the zone again, you can just see when he's at the plate and he takes that ball. Like he's like, you know, I know that's gonna be ball. That's a ball low. All right, I'll take my walk. Mm-hmm. And when he was struggling early this year, you can tell he was chasing those pitches. He's like, shit. I mean, I got to do something here. I haven't like gotten a hit in a couple of days or I mean, whatever it is. Well, yeah. Yeah, and like whatever it is, you can just tell that difference. Where like it's it's that same pitch that just like pitch low, whatever. It's, if it's either like a breaking ball, maybe it's a two seamer or a sinker. But when he's on, he just takes those pitches, and he'll go, he'll go o two to a walk. Like, like, like it's, it looks easy for him. It's like, yeah, all right. So you're just gonna pitch low to me now. I'll take those pitches. Mm-hmm. And when he was struggling, it just like, you could just tell he was pressing. And now he and he also credited. I mean, hey. We want to shit on Joe Madden for like some of the pitching decisions that he makes and you know getting Kendricks out when he was cruising again. Oh, but Chris Bryant actually like, gave him a little credit. He's like, yeah, like he noticed something in my swing and it was a little mechanical adjustment. And yep, they crashed him down a little working. bit. He it's got working. down. He got a little lower. He got a little lower too. Which, like you said, like he was he was he was letting he was missing the mistakes. He was taking the mistakes for just a strike. It's no big deal. Taking, taking the mistake for sure. A ball that was a drivable ball early on, he was just letting go. And then he was, again, he was expanding his zone a little bit, trying to press. Every yep. time he didn't get a hit, every time something happened, angry Chris Bryant, oh, you know, he had a, an off season of popularity. And and there was a little bit of a, an ex, you know, an excitement about maybe Chris is going to just light up the league. And he came out a little slow. And there's a little bit of a swell that comes up in pressure that you can almost feel every time he got down 0-2 like, yep. or 1-2, like the crowd, could almost, you can almost hear the chatter like, oh, shit, here we go. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to lie, as soon – Chris Brown's been like fair players in this era of Cubs baseball. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and lie and be like, whenever he came up when he was struggling and there was a couple of guys on base, you're like, shit. Uh, well, hopefully he gets a hit, but the last like two, three weeks, he's back to his MVP form. So he's one of those rare guys that honestly, he knows the strike zone better than the guys behind the dish calling the game. Like yeah. honestly, he knows, I don't know how many times this year too that he's taken a couple pitches borderline. They are not strikes, and they're called strikes. And I mean, he he knows the zone. I mean, Rizzo does too. Rizzo's thing is, I mean, he just digs in. He's he's hovering, man. I I don't think I've ever seen a player get so much of the plate with his upper body pre pitch. Like I mean, he's he's. I mean, you you honestly, if you if you can throw an inside strike to to Rizzo, you're a you're a, you're, you are Da Vinci. And I mean that Marlon, I forget his name, Richards, I think. Trent uh-huh. Richards or something. Richards. He struck him out uh two times before he gave up the home run to him on Thursday. But he he, he was throwing he was pinpointing that fast one side. I'm like, oh shit, that's impressive. And then he throws like a ball in the dirt and Riz was like, fuck you. 420 <laughs> feet to center. <laughs> well, there's been a lot made, you know, today's today's actually Tony Gwynn's what was it be like his 52nd birthday or 59th yeah, birthday? Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about that because there was a, a stat they threw out about, you know, how many times he faced Glavin, Maddox, and Spoltz. But watching Rizzo hit, 
I would pay good money to, to uh, great money to have a time machine, but to, to go have a time machine, bring Rizzo back with me and have him face Greg Maddox in his prime with that run that he has. I could see Maddox throwing a pitch at like the backside of his ass and, and, and running it back over the dish and like beating Rizzo. Like that's the only Kyle Hendricks, maybe the only that type of pitcher, maybe the only kind of guy when Rizzo's really hit firing on all cylinders that can actually get him out because you have to get way under there enough where he's given up on that pitch because yeah. I mean, he's digging in that way because he obviously he wants to get his arm. He's going to get his hands extended. He's going to drive the baseball. And he is, he is when he's on, he's a tough out and he's right now he's in that spot. And what are you going to do? You're going to go pitch around him. Cool. Have fun. There's the superstar behind you. Baez is like after him, Contreras. Superstar. Like Baez is becoming the player. Everybody prayed the Cubs could get. He is a Michael Jordan esque type. Of it's it's not like a he's not a he's not just like one of these consistently good players. He's Careful. he's the kind of guy that alters the game and not. The, Careful throwing Michael Jordan's name around on this podcast. Oh, hey, I'm gonna throw it up more so because I was talking. Yeah, about Javier Baez is way more exciting. I want Michael. Ryan Sandberg to give Chris number twenty three. He should give it. Careful now. But uh, so we're running up against time. Uh, the upcoming week for both teams actually looks pretty Ooh. favorable. Uh, Sox going to Toronto, play a just bad Blue Jays team right now. And then they're home, uh, I think, against Toronto. Uh, so A home and home? Uh, a know, home in Canada, eh? They're in Toronto, and then they come back home. I think they get Cleveland and home, and then Toronto at home again. But we'll have a show before they play Toronto again. And then the Cubs get Milwaukee, but it's in Chicago, so it doesn't matter. I don't want to say anything because I want to jinx it and then just come back. Right, I know. You should probably stay quiet, but I'll tell you to say it. 20 home runs. Just basically look at Kristen Yellow's home road splits. That's all we'll say about that. And then they go to Cincinnati. Um, so, you know, both teams got pretty solid weeks coming up. And uh, as always, you should be following us at Pinwheels and Ivy on – Pinwheels Ivy Pod on Twitter. Um, I didn't die, even though there was portions of the show where close, I was close. going to. I'm currently out of fluids, so I'm going to go curl in the fetal position and hopefully sleep for two days. So for Kevin, although I'm Zoe, and we will see you guys next week.